podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. I would like to thank the organizers that they invited me to participate in this beautiful conference and giving me the opportunity to talk today. In fact, I was talking about something which we learned when we investigated explicit models based on the heterotic string. And in fact, this has some experimental side to it as well, because we were set out to construct models which looked like the MSSM, and we actually at a given point following some rules, we found many of them. And then the question of course was, why are these models so successful? Do they have some properties which make them special? And that's what I want to talk today about. So, of course, when you think in terms of string theory and making connections to the real world in four dimensions, a lot of the parameters in the four-dimensional theory are given by uh, properties of the theory in extra dimensions. And some of the properties of the theory in extra dimensions is the localization properties of quarks leptons. So in some way, what I'll give you today, and this, is the re this will be the result of my talk, I will tell, give you a zip code for the quarks, leptons, and Higgs bosons. Where do they live in extra dimensions? If I want to find them, the electron, where should I look to? Is it spread out? Is it wrapped on a certain cycle? Is it sitting in some corner of the space? And what we actually found out in these models, the successful MSSM models, was that these successful models, they always had the Higgs bosons in the bulk, living in the full extra dimensions. And the same is true for the top quark because of the large top quark Yukawa couplings, whereas the first two families are localized at fixed point in the extra dimensions. And given the fact that these Higgs bosons, which are very important, they live in the bulk in extra dimensions, so they actually feel the full 10-dimensional theory. So they feel also in some way, as I will explain to you, they will feel in some way uh, the remnants of n equal to 4 supersymmetry which you had, which you would have if you just compactify the theory on a torus. And this legacy of higher dimensions will be one thing which will be mir mirage mediation, which is a scheme which appears in that theory. And there will also be some aspect what is called natural SUSI. Uh, although I should have, uh, I have to apologize, this will not be exactly the natural SUSI which uh, Savas was talking about. It might be some mixture of some mini split supersymmetry. Uh, there will be also discrete non abelian family symmetries, and it is this. Uh, uh, remnants of n equal to 4 supersymmetry that actually might hide supersymmetry at the LHC. So, now starting out this, I will go uh, quickly through uh, the strategy which we adopted uh, some years ago. Uh, one of the rules we, we, we had was that we wanted to have spinners of SO10 in extra dimensions because a family of quarks and leptons looks very much like a spin of uh, of SO10, 16-dimensional representation. And if you have that, a lot of the structure you cover couplings will come out correctly. Uh, there will also be discrete symmetries, so we go to some points of enhanced symmetries, not only because to get enhanced symmetries, but also because uh, we are forced to it by making some approximation. So now given that, you could also make a top-down uh, argumentation, and the top-down argumentation in cases might start with the maximal exceptional group E8 in the sense that nature should be exceptional. There's a maximal group. There's, of course, the question, how does it fit with what we have from the bottom up approach? Because we know that E8 should not be realized in four dimensions because of the chirality of the fermion representation. Well, you might have seen this picture, of course, that uh, you could explain, in fact, why the standard model belongs to the exceptional series in the way that you are chopping off nodes in the Dinkin diagrams. You come from E8 to E7, E6, then you come to E5, which, of course, is not exceptional. It is D5. Then it will be SU5, and the standard model will actually be E3. So this would be something which... Uh, is an argument. But in any case, the stronger bottom argument means that you want to have the spinners of O16. And once you assume that, in fact, you can actually make an argument that in a successful model, when you have 
would want like to put all the ingredients together, you actually better have an exceptional coup. Now, string theory, you might say, favors E8. Well, in some way, it is obvious in the E8 cross E8 theory, but also in the M and F theory picture, you can have an E8 enhancement as a non-perturbative effect. And in fact, it was argued also there that a lot of the nice properties of the model come from this fact that you have an E8. Now, strings live in higher dimensions. Of course, E8 has to be broken in the process of compactification. It provides a source for noon abelian discrete symmetries. And in fact, there is also this extra dimensional Lorentz group SO6, which in fact could be the source of an R symmetry. I mention that here because that might be important for the discussion later. So SO6 is the subgroup of SO9,1 of the Lorentz group in extra dimensions. And that SO6, of course, treats bosons and fermions differently. And that's actually, when you get this, this is a potential source of R symmetries. Now we're looking at the geography of these fields in extra dimensions. The location of quarks and leptons, as I said, is important. It's also important the relative location to the Higgs, if you, because that determines the Yukawa coupling. But there's also a kind of localization of the gauge field, although in the heterotic, there is, uh, there, is, uh, there is, of course, E8 in the bulk. But we will have certain places in the, 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 the extra dimensions where different gauge groups live, as I will explain in a moment. The observed four-dimensional gauge group is a common subgroup of all these various localized gauge groups. Of course, now we have to compactify. And in the compactification, uh, one way of doing it is what we'll do on a smooth Calabi-Yau manifold. Now, on this manifold, of course, now it's very difficult to see where particles live, and it's also very difficult to handle. But so we did an ap approximation, and the approximation, of course, looks very strong. It's the orbifold, flat orbifolds. But as we have learned over the times, also based on that work of these people in the early uh, in the mid 80s, is that a lot of the properties of the theory are actually incorporated in that theory and that moreover you can compute because you still have the conformal field theory methods at your disposal. So this is something which I call Berechenbarkeit. Uh, Berechenbarkeit is a German word. It means essentially calculability, but in fact it means more. It means also reliability and trustworthiness. Uh, in trying to translate this word into English, I failed. So if somebody of you has a better idea, uh, I will be happy uh, to adapt this. Of course, it requires, in some way, perturbative explicit string theory. It might also require, if you really want to compute uh, uh, reliably, also know the metric of the manifold. And that is, of course, difficult to know. And that's one of the reasons why you go uh, to, uh, to this orbifold approach. The other approach is that these points, these orbifolds, they are sitting in points of the modular space with, space with enhanced symmetry. And so it might very well be that this enhanced symmetry is what we see in nature. After all, we know that the electron mass is much lighter than the top quark mass. And many of the ways to understand that is in terms of a symmetry, a slightly broken symmetry. And so we might actually be uh, uh, happy that the world sits at a point which is maybe close to one of these fields, uh, places of enhanced symmetries. This in also includes discrete symmetries and enhanced supersymmetry in a way you will see later. So this is the setup. So we, we want to study these theories, and we explicitly look at consistent string vacua. So for example, if we have a symmetry in that theory, it is actually the symmetry of the full theory. It will not be broken by gravitational effects, as you could do it if you just assume it. So now I'll talk about this orbifolds the heterotic orbifolds. And now we have to look where do fields live. And in fact, there are three possible ways. They could either live on the bulk. This is called the untwisted sector of the orbifold. That is what you won't already get when you do a torus compactification. And then you have various twisted sectors. And you can have twisted sectors which are fixed points in the extra dimensions and those which uh, correspond to fixed tori in the extra dimensions. So you can have field living in the bulk in the 10 dimension theory. You can have fields which only live in four dimensions. They are point in extra dimensions. Or you can have fields which live in six dimensions where there is a two torus. Uh, two of the dimensions are in extra dimensions. 
Coming back to the gauge symmetry, so this is a model where, which has the standard model gauge group, but nonetheless in the extra dimensions, in the extra dimensions you have an enhancement of the gauge group at various points. So, for example, if a particle sits here, if the electron would sit at this point and there you locally have an SO10 symmetry, then you know that the full first family will sit at this point. In other points, you have a different symmetries and, in fact, the symmetry, the surviving symmetry will be the common symmetry which remains when you look at this picture and it's actually the standard model gauge group SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. So, you will also have these properties at certain localizations. You will have fixed gauge symmetry which might be enhanced compared to what you have in the four-dimensional world. So, this is the construction which we did, which we called the mini landscape, which was, uh, which was um, based on, I will explain in a moment, the set uh, 6.2 orbifold. Uh, we, we just made a computer assisted search and we came up with f uh, several hundred models which had the exact spectrum of the MSSM, no exotics, and we had family symmetries, we had Yukawa unification, we had a large top quark Yukawa couplings, we had models where we had some matter parity to forbid uh, the, the fast proton decay operators, and we also had some ideas how to do supersymmetry. So the sectors, the sectors in this uh, model are the untwisted sector, as I said, and here we have the set 62 or default. We chose it, meanwhile, we have done others, we chose it here because it it shows you fixed points and fixed tori. And it also has the C six is divisible by three. So if you want to make three family models, this helps in some cases. So there's the untwisted sector, which is the bulk. It in, would be a sector which at the three level, if you wouldn't see the twisting, it would actually have n equal to four supersymmetry. And then you have three twisted sectors comparing to this twist theta, which is a 60 degree rotation here. In the first twisted sector theta, there are fixed points. There are 12 fixed points, so this is the three tori represented here. Uh, this is G2 times uh, SU3 and the SO4. So these are fixed points. Then the theta square se twisted sector is fixed tori corresponding to fixed tori. So there are two times three fixed tori. So this would be sectors where you would ex have an underlying n equal to two supersymmetry if you would look at this sector alone. The same is true for the theta cube sectors. It also has fixed tori. And now, you, after having constructed this model, the question is, where do we find in this realistic models, where do we find the quarks, leptons, and the Higgs bosons? So I'm just telling you there is a, a benchmark model. At the fixed point, we have enhanced gauge symmetries. One of the U1s is anomalous, and this will drive some fields to get non-trivial vacuum expectation values. These will break over you once and we have worked out all this vacuum structure of the model in order to make all the exotics heavy and uh, break all the additional you ones. So at the end, that is what will be left. Now the spectrum of that model has the standard model spectrum plus singlets. I'm just flashing it here uh, so that you have seen uh, what will be there. The first question is the location of the Higgs bosons and uh, this has to do with the mu problem in the usual MSSM, but here it's worse because you typically have a multitude of Higgs pairs, like 10 let's say, and now you have to get rid of nine of them and keep one of them light. That's the mu problem. But now you see you need two things. You need first a convincing mechanism to make nine of the doublets heavy. And then you need a convincing mechanism why this mechanism didn't make the last one heavy as well. In fact, in the mini landscape we found, uh, after agonizing for some time, that there is, in many of the models, one Higgs pair which remains light and which we could not make heavy by this method of this putting vacuum expectation values in this potential. So we found that and we were actually, we were surprised. And later we found that it actually was protected by a discrete R symmetry in that theory. So the theory had a discrete R symmetry and this di discrete R symmetry was forbidding, uh, was forbidding the mu term. It also was forbidding 
as you might know, when you have an asymmetry, it was also forbidding a constant term in the superpotential, which is good so that we had uh, Minkowski vacuole before supersymmetry breakdown. So the Higgs bosons live in the untwisted sector. This you can also see because the field in the untwisted sector feels the extra dimensions fully. It has this SO6 Lorentz group, which is the source of the R symmetry. So that's what we found in these models. The next step is we had a heavy top quark, and the heavy top quark turned out to be also in the untwisted sector because that gave the maximal overlap with the Higgs bosons. And in many of the models, we just had one trilinear Yukawa couplings. And so we had a top quark in the untwisted sector. It was also in the bulk. The rest of the third family uh, particles were not so uh, well, are not, they, they can be at various places. So this third family is like uh, a family where the kids have moved out of the house and it's still the top quark which remains at home. The first and second family, on the other hand, they live on fixed points. And so they live on in, in just in four dimensions, and in fact they live at these fixed points here, alpha one, beta one, and one family sits here at gamma equal to one, one at gamma equal to three, and in fact that's very nice. We have the full family there, and we have actually a non-abelian discrete family symmetry, which is here a D4, where these two are doublet. This is good for the flavor problem. So what we have, we have Higgs doublets in the bulk, the heavy top quark in the bulk, the mu term protected by an R symmetry. We have Minkowski vacua before SUSY breaking. And that's the solution to the mu problem. Actually, a similar solution to the mu problem has been considered by Casas and Munoz already in the 90s. So, in a supersymmetric vacuum, the R symmetry is unbroken. So, it's not supersymmetry which predicts mu, but it is. The, the crown state being supersymmetric forbids the mu mu term. So when you then break supersymmetry, you will get the mu term of the order of the supersymmetry breaking scale, the, let's say the Cravitino mass. So we have these localization properties of the models, and now we want to exploit them. And that uh, is now a question of what does that mean in a model where we have broken supersymmetry. Actually, these models have also a hidden sector of the second E8. And the hidden sector gauge group can be determined. It's in most of the cases something like SU4 or SO8. And if you then would have fixed the gauge coupling constant in the way you would knight it, it would actually predict a Cravitino mass in the TV multi TV range. Now, I cannot describe the scheme of supersymmetry breaking. I want only to make clear one point which is very generic when you do this string theory the string theory, and that is that we, uh, we have, in string theory, typically a flux, and you have a non-perturbative effect, let's say, like a Gagino condensation. So the potential will look like uh, flux plus minus the exponential of minus x. Now, typically, when you are now looking for the minimum of that theory, unless there is an explicit fine-tuning, these two things will be of the same order of magnitude, the flux and the exponential of minus x. But because of the exponential, there will be some hierarchy between the x and the flux. So the x, in fact, turns out in most of this, once you, uh, once you have adjusted the vacuum energy, that there is a factor in the theory which is the log of m Planck over m3 half. And this is a quantity which actually in that theory suppresses the modulus contribution to the soft term. So we have a suppressed modulus contribution, which otherwise would be dominant. Now x, if you just take the numbers numerically, m Planck and m3 half, is of the order of 4 pi squared. So in fact, it is pretty strong suppression. And that means that radiative corrections become important. So radiative corrections, as for example in anomaly mediation, might compete with this suppressed uh, contribution. And this mirage scheme uh, is actually a mixed modulus anomaly mediation scheme. If you want to know the reason for the name and you don't know it, you can ask me at the end of the talk. So we will have a mirage pattern that is uh, of gauge masses will be suppressed compared to the 
uh, gravitino mass, which is this, the general source of supersymmetry breaking. And so they will be suppressed and they will also have a compressed spectrum. And it's actually generic. It was first found in the type 2 uh, flux uh, uh, theory compactification as it was set up by KKLT and it is also happening in the heterotic theory. So now what comes out in this case, the overall pattern, which I cannot explain in detail, I just give you the result. You, let's, we have a gravitino mass in the multi TV range. That's what we need in order to have a reasonable, uh, a reasonable cluino mass, for example, because if this, this will be, if the gravitino mass will be too high, the cluino will be too low. The normal squarks and the sleptons are in fact in the multi TEV range, what you would have expected for all the scalars. But now comes the catch. In fact, when you have fields which have this property in the untwisted sector, they in fact feel some remnants of n equal to 4. Some of you might know that there is this, this structure of the no scale models, where you have broken supersymmetry, you have a non vanishing gravitino mass but all soft terms vanish. And that you in fact can understand in terms of a torus compactification where in fact when fields are in the untwisted sector you will have this suppression. So this suppression of the mirage scheme will not only work for the gay genos but it will also work for those particles which live in the untwisted sector that is the top quarks, the Higgses. Also the A parameters are in the TV range, gay geno masses are in the TV range and there is this compressed spectrum uh, of gay genome masses typical for the Mirage scheme. Moduli are heavy, which is also quite good because they are actually enhanced by this logarithm. So now give, let me give you a benchmark model. So this is a benchmark model for a gravitino mass of 15 TeV. And here you see various reasons. This the white region is allowed. Uh, this region is ruled out because there are tachyons. The blue reason region is ruled out because in this case the stop would be the lightest, the lightest SUSY particle. And the green region is the region which is ruled out by the direct measurements of the Higgs. And here this corresponds to 115 GeV and this corresponds to 127 GeV. That was the pre-discovery uh, pre uh, region of that. I will show you later. These lines here show the masses of the stop. So we have chosen this benchmark point to have relatively low stop masses. And this hatched area here, that is the area which is ruled out by direct supersymmetry searches up to now. So you see the direct supersymmetry searches have not yet cut in the, to the relevant parameter space which we have here. So this model which we get here has a spectrum like that you will have a spectrum where here, this is for 15 TeV uh, gravitino, TeV gravitino, so this will be something like 11 TeV, the cluino will be at 2800 GeV, and you will see this will be the lightest uh, vino and the top, uh, the stops will be here. If you would go too low, they would become the LSP, this is why you are sitting close to that range. And the Higgs mass here is 126 GeV. So now when you now so look at the discovery of the Higgs boson and when you now say, okay, the mass range is not between 114 and 129, but more between 124 and 127, then you will actually get a plot where this green region will enlarge. And this green region enlarges dramatically. This is just the fact that 126 GeV is at the upper end of what you can do in the MSSN. So you can actually see that now all what is green is ruled out by the Higgs discovery within the model, within the constraints of the MSSM and that is the region, well this is 2011 data so probably today this will be somewhat better but in some way that will be ruled out and uh, if you, so this was the one before and this is now what happened after that. And that is just reflection of this. Fact that in the MSSM 126 GeV is at the upper range of it. 
So what we have, we have large gravitino masses in the multi-TV range, we have the gageno masses in, in this picture and uh, that is what sometimes is called natural supersymmetry, natural in the sense that uh, you, the stops are light and the cluinos are also relatively light. Orfei this has to take in here with a grain of salt. And there's also, and that should not be underestimated, there's also this pattern of the gay genome masses which is more compressed. And that's very important when you confront that with uh, observations of the LHC. Because in the LHC you're looking for missing momentum. So if you have a cluino and it decays into the lightest particle, which in the plot which Sava showed was zero, then it, there's a possibility that this lightest particle takes away a lot of energy. So you will see it easily when you're looking for missing energy. However, if the cluino compared to the bino is not, and in the, in the standard picture this, is, this will be six to one. But if this is smaller now, then in fact this heavier particle will, if it is very close to the mass of the cluino, it will be produced at rest. And if it, it produced at rest, it cannot take much uh, missing momentum out to one side of the detector. So it's this combination of light stops, relatively light stops, and this compressed spectra which makes it very difficult uh, uh, to find this at the LHC. So I'm coming to the conclusions. What I was trying to tell you is that in a wide class of these models, this is of course in the heterotic models, uh, the realistic models, they require the Higgs multiplets to live in the bulk. And I think that might be a sign that also in other models, like in F-theory, it might be look useful to look also for situations where Higgs bosons live in the bulk and not only on these points. This implies gauge you cover unification because, uh, because they live in the bulk, they have a trilinear you cover coupling to the Higgs with the top quark, and that is of the order of the gauge coupling. That's the string coupling, that's the gauge coupling. Other fields tend to be localized, like the two light families. They are localized at fixed points. They could be at tori, that depends on the model. Here they were localized at fixed points, and they show discrete family symmetries. So there is this legacy from the extra dimensions that we get more symmetries, like the discrete family symmetries. This notion of mirage mediation, the suppressed contribution of supersymmetry breaking terms to the fields in the untwisted sector. So this is uh, in, in the absence of another name, I call it heterotic supersymmetry. It's more than just n equal to 1 SUSI and d equal to 4. It provides the zip code for the MSSM fields. It gives you the solution to the mu problem with an R symmetry and all the things I have told you and uh, if you like supersymmetry and sometimes you cannot sleep at night because you are afraid uh, that it would not be found, then you should read this sentence that uh, the fact that we do not see supersymmetric particles at the LHC does not imply that Susie is absent. It's actually due to the fact that we have more supersymmetry than we originally expected. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Hans Peter? where you stabilize all the moduli and really get those generic predictions for soft SUSY mass? Well, not, not, we, we have examples where we have stabilized all the moduli, but these are not necessarily this model which I showed here as a benchmark model. But you see, we have these techniques when we are going through the supersymmetric vacuum states, which, in, which let you allow to fix many moduli in a supersymmetric way. If you look at this, uh, this, this, this work done, done by Anderson, Cray et al., it is this counterpart that it comes from the Chern-Simons terms, which appears in the 3H form where the fields have a vacuum expectation value. What is a bit tricky is the dilaton, as you might know. So the last field to, to stabilize is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is somewhat tricky, uh, but there we are not better and not worse uh, than uh, in any other scheme because you have to adjust the vacuum energy at the end and with that uh, thing you can actually fix the dilaton here.